All right. Um, I bought a really cheap tripod at a thrift store in an attempt to be more cinematographical in my shots, my personal in-my-face shots. Still going to work on setting up proper background. Nobody probably cares to see a forsythia, but it's something. Um, but I'm trying to get better at filming these shots because my, my POV shots that shows you, you know, that I do most of my updates in, some people don't mind them, some people want to see a face, but they're probably going to be what I'm, what a majority of my videos are going to be because that's what I do when I'm working on the homestead, I take video of what's going on. So hopefully I can make the intro or outro a tad more entertaining. So you can see I'm wearing my cool octopus hat. Whenever I need to film a video, I put this on so you can't see my horribly messed up hair. So anyway, business aside. So we've been really busy on the homestead and with the house because we had a, um, a house, finally had a, a housewarming party. So we were rushing to get that done. So I haven't, it's been taking me a while to build up enough footage to create what I think is a good video, a good amount for uh, an, an update here on the channel. So I've got some things to share. Um, before I get to the actual video, I want to take this opportunity to throw some theoretical stuff at you or some academic stuff, those things that I don't have actual footage of, but I want to talk about. So I was thinking long term about good sources of fast growing material, cellulose material, carbon material for so I'm going to shred up for animal bedding, for mulching, for mulch, um, carbon source for the compost, things of that nature. And sure, I've got tons of land that I need to clear, and I'm going to have a whole lot of wood and a great amount of carbon source. Uh, but, but it's like I feel like I want to do something that's faster growing and something that I can like specifically cultivate. So I've started thinking about possibly introducing a cold hardy, fast growing, fast spreading bamboo variety here on the homestead. Um, in particular, I've been looking at Pirubro marginata, so or red margin bamboo, because it's it grows nice and big, it grows fast, it spreads fast, the, the actual shoots are human edible, um, and in general bamboo, from what I've been reading, is uh, can be good fodder for goats. They like to eat the, the leaves and the smaller branches on it. And I was thinking of also, if I had a nice thick bamboo variety, which red margin is, it gets, it gets pretty thick, the more mature, uh, mature canes. Maybe if I lash them together, I can use it as a living fence. So I've been thinking a lot about this. So I'm gonna start experimenting. I may, from a local nursery, buy a small amount of, small amount of uh, bamboo just to see how fast it grows and get a feel for it, because I've never really worked with true bamboo. Around these parts, we have what we call bamboo, but it's actually Japanese knotweed, which apparently is also good goat fodder. But it's not very. So I apologize for any weird editing, video editing transition you just experienced. I don't have the greatest phone for capturing video, so I have very little storage space and next to nothing, even when I delete everything off my phone. So I, I was actually trying to film this intro and it cut out, you know, because I ran out of space. So I just had to go dump everything off my phone. So I apologize. I really need a better phone, maybe a better camera as well. But in any case, let's continue. So bamboo, something to think about. Uh, so I've been watching, I just started, I just subbed to uh, a new channel, Rev, Revos TV, Revtos TV. Forgive me if I messed up that name. I'll put a link below and I'll let you figure out how to pronounce it. Um, but he has this rail, kind of like, a, I think he calls it a hydro tube, but it looks like the rail system that I once had. Now you don't see, you haven't seen a lot about aquaponics or heard a lot of aquaponics on my channel because I'm not really currently doing it because I got all this other um, homesteading stuff to do. But previously when I lived in the suburbs, indoors hydropon, uh, excuse me, well, to a little, to a small extent hydroponics, but aquaponics I was very, very big into. and. With a homestead, I didn't think I'd ever care to do it again, and keeping fish inside was like, eh. And now I have a pond, so now all the coiter are in the pond. But I did enjoy growing inside, I did enjoy aquaponics, and especially nice during the winter. So, you know, watching his aquaponics setup, I started thinking about my old rail system. Now I've tried every type of, you know, aquaponics system you can imagine, like 
media-filled beds, or flood and drain, etc., etc. So I had like sort of a deep water culture rail system where it was a vinyl uh, fence post, uh, very big, around, and very long. Um, and I put net cups in those and ran the fish water through it. It's a pretty decent setup. I actually had eight um, various kinds of peppers gr growing in it underneath a 400 watt high intensity discharge light. And it was such a beautiful setup. I had so many peppers and this was growing like right in my kitchen. It was pretty amazing. Definitely, if, I, if I'm clever, if I can find some old photos, I'll try to like put them in here somehow. It's like an overlay or some fancy editing thing. Uh, I really enjoyed it. So I th got thinking maybe I'll do that again at some point. Um, I do kind of miss it. But that also got me thinking about what I'm going to use to power it. Now there's two things, possibly. I might look into aerobic digestion, where basically it's a big tub full of uh, pureed vegetable material, stuff that I might throw in a regular compost. I throw in the water, put a bunch of air stones, and allow it to uh, decompose in the water in as aerobic environment as I can do. The advantage of that is it doesn't produce methane like anaerobic would be, like if you just left it in there without the air stones, without that aeration which causes, you know, some nasty, nasty stuff. With aerobic, you get the nitrates, you get the, the sulfates, you get the phosphates, all those stuff that the plants will want to utilize in a utilizable form. But the gas it produces is carbon dioxide, which if you're smart, you can pipe that directly to your plants and they'll grow in a carbon dioxide rich environment. That might be pretty cool. Then I'm like, well, maybe I do want to raise some kind of animal in this, this, this theoretical, this hypothetical aquaponic system down the road, maybe this winter. The other day I had lobster for the first time in a very long time. I grew up in an area where lobster was very common, seacoast type thing. I didn't live directly on the coast, but in that area. And I kind of missed it, and I'm not a wealthy person, so it's not like I can eat lobster all the time. So I was thinking maybe trying crawfish, like, like uh, the red claws, the Australian red claws, and use those to power an indoor aquaponics. At this point, I'm just talking. Um, just wanted to include it here and try to make the, you know, throw, I've always, I always got these ideas and experiments I want to try. So these intros would be a good place to throw them out at you to see what you think. And then once I'm actually doing them, I'll give, you know, actual footage and show you what's going on and how I'm doing them. So we'll see about that. So I think that's about all I had to blabber on about. So hopefully you enjoyed this very extended intro. And now I'm going to show you a bunch of the, the, the footage I've been capturing over the last couple weeks, actually. And um, I'll talk to you later. Be sure to subscribe, like, share, comment, share, subscribe, like. It helps me out and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. So all my poultry, my birds, drink way too much water. So, and it was getting a little annoying to go in there and just making sure, and I'm so afraid about leaving them to dehydrate and die. So, I needed a setup. So, this is the first automatic timer I've ever purchased. I just found it at the local big box store and thought I'd give it a try. So, I have a very, very simple setup. This is, again, I'll show it to you, but it's not the permanent long-term solution, but I do want to automate my feeding and watering of animals as much as possible. So, what I've done here is, obviously, bought a timer. It's a little leaky, so I need to get some Teflon tape for that. But I have a hose running doo -doo 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 -doo. over to the coop. Hello, cat. Over to the coop here. And I have it split going into these two uh, planter boxes that I'm using as troughs. Um, now I realize that the optimal chicken watering setup would probably be a length of PVC pipe here and no automatic timer, just get those chicken nipples. But the thing is, at least for right now, I have Indian runner ducks and I need them to actually have a deep pool of water that they can wash their beak and face in to avoid any kind of infection from what I understand. I'm no ducks, duck expert, but I hear they, they need some deep water. So I'm going trying these troughs for right now, and I've only tried it once. It seems to work. I have it set uh, for just one mi uh, one minute interval, and it fills up the troughs this much at one minute. And I have it to refill every six hours, so we'll see how that works. I'll check in on it later tonight. But I think this will be a good system for right now. Um, it's really, really just what I had available, other than the timer. 
and we'll see how it works. So the chickens can definitely get in there, get a drink, and the ducks can get in and wash their faces. Now obviously this is not a long-term solution, I'll come up with a better one, especially if I end up separating my poultry chickens. If only chickens are in here, I'll probably go with the more simple chicken nipple watering system that you see all over the YouTube. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to give you a heads up of what I'm doing with these crazy, crazy birds. Because it's, it's been really hot and really dry around here these days, and these waterers that I have are kind of a pain in the butt to refill. And I was having to refill them at least twice, both of them at least twice a day. And it's just, I ain't got time for that. <laughs> So, my uh, attempts at cloning in a potting mix, or a seed starting mix, didn't work out. You might remember from a previous video that I took cuttings of a lilac and rose bushes, and I used rooting hormone and put them in a seed starting mix, covered them you know, in a plastic cup and covered them with a, a sandwich bag, plastic sandwich bag. Those kind of molded and didn't really work out. They kind of looked, some of them looked like they were going to take but anyway, that method of cloning is probably not ideal because I couldn't tell if roots were developing. And I've been watching JT Bear and his aeroponic cloner, and I was like, you know what, I think I have the parts to at least create something close to that because I, I went through this exp I, experimental stage, if you will, with um, deep water culture hydroponics. So I have an air pump, I have air stones, and tons of buckets. So I just cut holes in buckets. I had um, a hole saw for to fit, I believe it's one and three quarters inch net cups. So I went ahead and used that. Instead of net cups, I have this pond liner. It's basically just thick rubber. Um, I have tons of pond liner left over from when I created my own pond. So I use this to just hold on to the, uh, the clippings. And as you can see, they're suspended in air. Put a little rooting hormone on each of them and the air stones will bubble up and spritz little bits of water onto the, the cuttings and hopefully I'll see roots develop. Now what do I have here? I have a sweet potato slip. Figured that will probably be an easy one. This is a seedless Concord grape. This is an indigo rose tomato. This is a thornless blackberry. This is the peach sorbet blueberry. And these are two lilac cuttings. So we'll see how this goes. I, you know, I just threw this together. I'm all about the experimentation. So let's see see what we can do with this. And I'll definitely keep you updated. Quick shot of that air pump. Ooh. So I have a well-known addiction to buying seeds. I have a lot of seeds. Every time I go through the seed catalogs, which you can see from here from the packaging is mostly Baker Creek, aka rareseeds.com, there's always a new variety. I'm like, I must have those seeds. And sometimes I don't even get around to growing them. I just like having them. Someday, hopefully I'll grow them before the seeds go bad. But I really needed to get organized because previously I just threw them literally in a big messy pile inside that plastic container. So I just wanted to get a little bit more organized. Now I just bought new work shoes. Um, not Nothing fancy, but something a little bit better than wearing my sneakers all over the place while I'm walking through mud and chicken poop and other such things. Uh, but I had this box and I was like, you know what, if I just put cardboard and create three rows, I'll have a place to at least somewhat organize my seeds. So nothing fancy here. I just took some cardboard and I divide them up by types or types as I recognize them. So pepper, tomato, eggplant, which I have one of because I don't really like eggplant, but I was really, this ping tongue appealed to me. Um, but yeah, just divide it up and I'll probably get more specific as things go through. As you'll notice, I just have greens, which includes pretty much anything that's a leafy green or eaten like a leafy green. And I'll probably get more specific. So it might be like Asian greens or it might be you know, maybe a whole section of mustard family, because I tend to like those. So anyway, just wanted to share. Very, very simple. I'm just trying to get more organized as a homesteader and try not to be so chaotic in all my projects. So I think we're overdue for moving 
the goat pen. They've been in this area for, I don't know, a little while. Um, this part had been mowed, but then I had two big sections of uncut, um, not just grass, but like wild grape and some other like various bramble and stuff. And they didn't touch it for a while. It seemed like they were never really eating it, but all of a sudden they just cleared it out. Um, I have been trying to feed them less pellets, so they're now searching for some pellets that, left, that were left on the ground in hopes that they would actually eat all the stuff that's available to them, and they have, so I think it's probably time to move on. I might move them back to the, around this big mass, or plug in the other fence and extend their area so they can get in there, because that's they started working on that when I had them in this section before, um, before my fence issue and I lost the ducks. It's about that time that I moved them over. But I may extend them right there. It's a little difficult because on that side it's a little hilly and the fence grounds out a little bit. So we'll see how that goes. But yeah, I'll move them over because I think they're definitely done here. I'm going to do that later when the heat's not quite so intense. And I'll probably let them out. I've actually let them out a few times to like do their thing and run and scamper and romp. Uh, and they stick around. They run all over the place, but they do stick around. And they, they come more or less when you know, you have food. So I'm not too concerned about just sort of letting them go. Always supervised, of course. Hey, babies. <laughs> Sweet little things. So I just wanted to share with you, um, you know, it's not homesteading specifically, but, you know, we bought an old home and there's a lot of little projects that I wanted to share, especially the outside projects, just to, you know, give you a heads up of what goes on in our lives. Um, we actually had a new well put in, new well dug. The old well was so encrusted, the well casing itself and the pipes leading up to the house were so encrusted with some kind of material um, that when we brought an inspector to inspect the plumbing specifically in the well, um, he said it was so bad, he's just like, you're better off building, just digging a new well. The old well was very old. It was probably time. It also had, there was also a detection of some kind of not so great bacterium in it, um, which probably could have been handled with the bleaching or whatever they do. But in any case, we just decided to dig a new well. So we ended up clearing out this spot. They've brought their trucks in. They finally hit water at 700 feet. Um, so it was a lot deeper than we expected to go. I don't know if it's because it's so dry right now, or I don't really know about geology and how water aquifers work. But this is a pretty wet area, so I figured they didn't have to go down too deep, but they did. And even then, when they hit the water, it wasn't the flow rate they wanted. So we actually had them come back in and do what's called hydrofracking, which opens up the, the channels in between aquifer, individual pockets of water to increase the flow. So theoretically, at this point, We've, we're now not only accessing the original aquifer that we tapped into at 700 meter, uh, excuse me, 700 feet, but theoretically all those horizontally positioned to it. So hopefully we'll have good water flow. But um, if nothing else, we cleared out a section of land that I'll need to be clearing out anyway. Yeah, you can't judge how far this goes back, back obviously, because it's so overgrown, but there's a good couple acres that way that I'm eventually going to clear out and Probably that's where the animals will be rotated someday, in some beautiful silvo pasture or something. But anyway, just an update on all the crazy stuff we go through to fix up this old house. So, I'm not really sure what this is. Maybe there's some flower experts. I don't really know flowers, I'll be quite honest, especially, you know, just random flowers that are growing on our property. Are these thistles? I'm not sure. Whatever they are, I'm definitely keeping them and possibly looking to spread them even further because everything loves these flowers. These bees, I don't know if they're my bees, these honeybees. This is, I've seen so many of them on this plant and I'm hoping they're mine. <laughs> um, if not, at least some honeybees are getting, getting some food. But bees love this. I see all sorts of bees, bumblebees, honeybees, various kinds of solitary bees. This is probably the most bee attractive plant I think we have on our property right now. So whatever it is, I really want a lot of them. So if anyone knows what this plant is, please let me know. I, it looks like a thistle to me, for what little I, I know about flowers, but here's the leaf. If you know, let me know. 
again, just amazing, amazing, amazing tractor of pollinators.